So good evening everybody. My name is Adrian Hall. I am a developer advocate with the AWS Mobile Group. So we are intently interested in uh, meeting, greeting and helping uh, mobile developers around the world with their cloud needs. And in the recent weeks, we released two things that are interesting to React Native developers. Um, we had our um, AWS reInvent conference, which was something like 49,000, 50,000 people um, packed into Las Vegas, um, into a very small area, you could hardly move there. Um, but these, uh, these were uh, introduced there, and we'll be going through them. Just a bit about me. Um, this is me, if you want to follow me. I've got a blog, I've got email, I've got a Twitter account. So, um, there are lots of AWS services, lots and lots and lots of them. Um, fortunately, most of the AWS services are uh, not interesting to mobile developers. It's not that they're not great, um, uh, great services, but um, to be a mobile optimized service, um, it kind of needs to meet a bunch of requirements for commercialization of uh, mobile apps. So we categorize them in several places. Um, these are the ones that I see most often. Um, on the top side, what I call the essential services, analytics, which is provided by Amazon Pinpoint, identity and authentication authorization, which is provided by Amazon Cognito, and testing, everyone should be into uh, UI testing um, on real devices. We have uh, AWS Device Farm, which is a collection of uh, several tens of thousands of devices um, scattered around the world to, uh, um, to uh, handle UI testing. In the major side, database, we're gonna be talking about that today, but we have NoSQL, SQL, big databases, big data stores, whatever you need there. Um, file storage, that is uh, one of the most venerable services in the AWS uh, collection, S3. And Cloud Logic, which is a combination of AWS Lambda and API Gateway, which together allow you to do serverless um, REST endpoints. And then we have a, a whole bunch of so, uh, use case specific ones for do, dealing with machine learning, text to speech, chatbots, that sort of thing. So, what was the problem? Um, AWS Amplify was really, so, really solving one particular problem, which is it is incredibly hard to do these tasks securely with just JavaScript or and you have to really dip your uh, toes into the native world. Um, all of these services require that the requests be cryptographically signed. And cryptographic signing is complicated, CPU intensive, and if you do it in JavaScript, you end up jumping across that bridge several hundred times during the computation. So what you would find, and this was certainly actually my first React Native blog ever, um, was um, doing a login screen for Amazon Cognito, and it worked wonderfully in the emulator, it worked wonderfully in the simulator, and the performance was complete trash when it went on to real devices. Um, just to give you an idea, I could complete an authentication request in less than 0.1 seconds in the simulator, and it took over half a minute in, uh, the, in a real device. And that was because there was these several hundred cryptographic um, mathematical functions that I had to do, and the mathematical function was in the native bridge, and it had to return, and I was setting off hundreds of these things going across that very, very narrow uh, roadway. Um, so one of the aims of the Amplify library was to make sure that the functions that we could were optimized for the platform. Um, we've got four basic areas, analytics, authentication, file storage, and API access. Um, how many people have heard of AWS Mobile Hub? 
two, three. Awesome, three, sorry. Um, if I skip back two years, um, then the problem was mobile developers don't know how to configure AWS services. Not only do they not know how to configure AWS services, they don't want to know how to configure AWS services. But they still want a mobile backend um, for storing their uh, data in the cloud. So, how do we solve that problem? And the answer was, and I'll do a quick demo um, back here. This is the AWS console. The answer was Mobile Hub. And what we allow you to do is create your project name. Create a project. And then instead of configuring Cognito and Pinpoint and S3 and all the others, React Native, that sounds like a good idea. Um, we'll configure those for you, but we'll do it with a simplified interface and we'll do it with the best practices in mind on the assumption that everyone's mobile app is going to go to 10 million users. So that means that the same um, back end that you create with Mobile Hub will solve your needs for the short term in your development cycle by not charging you anything. And then when you get really popular and you go to those 10 million users, which every mobile app developer really wants to do, um, and you start getting lots of income, you can then start scaling and you don't have to change the architecture of your mobile backend if you get really popular. It just works. Um, it's a concept known as serverless, um, which we like. And uh, it works just like this. So here's my app. I've just created my app. And now I have a whole bunch of um, features that I can add. So we turn on analytics for you. This is important. Um, we also have this hosting and streaming facility. The only reason for that is because a lot of apps are both a web app and a mobile app and use the same facilities, so we, we turn it on for you. Um, you kind of, you're going to need this AWS exports file, so I'll just download that now. Um, and I should have uh, configured it first. But what we allow you to do is there's, um, there's messaging and analytics. The other service that I'm going to show off today is authentication, because authentication UIs are always the first thing that you have to deal with when you're dealing with an authenticated session. We like to deal with them at the end, so we, we make it a two-liner for you to integrate, and, um, and then we just move on from there. So to, to do user sign-in, I want a username and password. So here's my email and password. I want to use a username, I want to use a phone number, I've got the option for multi-factor authentication. Um, I like really insecure um, uh, passwords, um, but I get to choose, you know? Um, the top password length is, um, let's call it very long, more, more, more characters than anyone would care to use. Um, and then I create the use pool. That's it, I'm done. Authentication implemented in under 30 seconds. And the same thing would go for NoSQL, um, the same thing would go for user storage, the same thing would go for a chatbot. Chatbots, they're a bit more complicated, I'll be honest. It does generally take about 15 minutes to configure those. Um, but it's not very long. And this allows me to get on with what is important to me, which is developing my mobile app. Yeah? So I'm gonna quickly go back to my project your project name. I'm going to go back into my hosting and streaming because I just deleted, I'm just going to delete this AWS Xbox because that only had messaging in it. Um, and I'm going to download a new one. Okay, so that is Mobile Hub in a, a nutshell. It's a serverless backend that is really easy to configure and move forward with your front end. Um, now we wanted to make Amplify as easy to use as that. Okay? So how do we do it? This is an app I have. Um, it's a notes app. I've been using this as a demo for a while. It has Redux, it has React, uh, Redux Persist for persisting the state of the, uh, um, the Redux store onto uh, local storage. Um, it has React Navigation, which I hate. Um, or rather I love to hate. Um, 
it, it's um, it, it's just a basic app. Um, you can you can download this app. It has no cloud facilities in in it whatsoever. Um, we're trying to open source all of our samples now, so um, you get lots of uh, quality samples like this. And um, it's available on github.com slash aws-samples, uh, so you can just download it. Um, the first thing I need to do is yarn add aws amplify react native. I tried, I, I honestly uh, petitioned for React Native AWS Amplify, they didn't go for it. Go figure. Um, so that's the first thing I need to do. And then I need to link in Amazon Cognito Identity JS. This is um, the bridge code to native that allows us to do the cryptographic signing of the um, of each connection um, in native code rather than in hundreds of little uh, connections. Now, to I, I downloaded the AWS export, so I'm going to um, copy that into dot slash src, and now I'm ready to go. That's the installation. So, how do I write code? Um, Import Amplify. Import my configuration. And configure it. I'm done. That's analytics added. Was that even 30 seconds? So, I'm now going to uh, Yarn Run iOS. And it's going to compile it. And the first time you compile, this is one of the things about native bridges, is it will have to recompile um, after you've done it. One, normally, you can just hit um, Command R or, or Control R to reload the, um, the JavaScript bundle. But if you've, got, if you've included a brand new native bridge, you're going to have to recompile it from scratch. So um, whilst that uh, happens, um, you can also add in um, custom events to this, so they will be sent to Amazon Pinpoint as well. And what you'll get is you'll get right out of the box, just three lines, you'll get session data. So you'll get the demographics like how many people are using Android, how many people are using iOS, what type of machines, what's the make and model of their, um, of their phones or uh, uh, tablets. Um, that sort of thing is, uh, is just built in with that amplify.com figure. You can also create um, custom events, which are random events. So if I want to know how many times is add note clipped in this app, then I can do that very simply. Um, my add note is in my notes detail screen for some reason. Um, there it is. And I can just do analytics dot record add note. Fairly easy. I'm going to get analytics in from Amplify. So import analytics from AWS. And we'll see that uh, add note come in. So launching iPhone, done. And if I go back to my simulator, um, there's my plus button, test. Why does the hardware always freeze? Connect hardware keyboard, there we go, there we go. And then automatically save, of course. And now I'm going to go back into this is still in Mobile Hub, same thing, and there's this analytics link here. Now, the first time it comes in, there is a about a three or four minute wait as it uh, generates the database for you, but you have automatically have information about the events. When it loads, load. 
seriously know. So there I have my one endpoint, so that's a good sign, means uh, events are coming in. And there will be a short delay whilst AWS um, wakes up. Uh, the US is awake, that's what the problem is. And you can see I already have my add note there, so it always seems longer waiting for something when you're going like, low, damn it. Um, so I, I can actually see those and I can see the events, but I can also go into what's the usage, what's the users, I can see endpoints. Now, we do make a distinction between endpoints and users. Everyone wants to know in mobile app uh, development, if you want to measure the effectiveness of your app, you want to do a daily active user or a monthly active user count. Um, we do daily active endpoints and daily active users as two different things. I personally, did I put them away? Yeah, I think I put them away. I carry around a phone and a tablet all the time, okay? Those are two endpoints. There will always be two endpoints. Um, if I authenticate to my app the same way on both, both times, I'm one user. So it'll be one user, two endpoints. So you, you get an actual count of the users and you can actually see how many devices that people are actually using. Um, as you get custom events, you'll be able to record on those. Now, the interesting thing, and this is a philosophy of AWS in general, you own your data. It may seem very simple, but think about the Google model, think about who actually owns that data um, and how you can get it out. Um, so one of the things that you can do is all the data that's stored in the pinpoint database, you can kick off a stream to automatically and in real time store it in another database. So it could be Aurora, it could be Big Data, it could be DynamoDB, whatever you want. And you can connect your own reporting system to that. So if your organization has paid the money for Tableau, Tableau goes against Aurora pretty nicely. Um, you can do a constant stream of all the data that we're storing here into Tableau, into Aurora, and then Tableau can report on that and you can create any reports that you want. So if you don't like the graphs and charts and uh, reporting that is here, create your own. Um, it's, it's your data. And that's a very, very different change from uh, uh, places like Google. So that's analytics. That was pretty easy. Um, let's move on to authentication. Because um, I did add a, um, a, a user pool, which is a username and password. Um, and we've got a HOC. So I'm going to say with authenticator. It's just another import, and that's from the same library. And I'm going to wrap the application. Now, if I was building my own app, I would not do this. Because this slams a paywall, it slams a, a, an authentication screen right when the, the app starts. And that's probably a bad idea because um, people don't like to, to do that. I'd probably link it into you know, a login icon or a cloud icon or something like that. But um, let's see how that works. I'm going to run it again. And we'll go over to the thing. And now I've got a sign in and sign up uh, process. Well, I've just created this user pool, so I don't have created. So let me sign up. Um, Adrian, and I had a really, really simple password, but I'm always paranoid, so I'll create one. I'll do my, pass my, um, my real email and my real phone number, because I'm actually going to get a validation. So I'll sign up. And there's my code on my phone. And I'm going to confirm. Maybe it's kept the way. Ah, yes. You might be right. There we go. So it's capital A. And now I can sign in with my password. So that was full validation with Authenticator, two lines of code. 
And I like two lines of code. Two lines of code is good because I don't want to deal, if I've got a, let's say, a three-month-long project developing a mobile app, I don't want to spend the first two weeks developing an authentication screen. I want to get to where my app is actually being used. The, the authentication screen, it's good, but it's something that I don't really care about until the end when I'm fit doing the final uh, fit and finish for the, for the app. So this lets me get on. That was, well, it was less than five minutes, put it that way. Um, so uh, that, that's the sort of thing. Now, the interesting thing is, is if I go back to my uh, pinpoint, there'll still be, if we go to analytics, users, Now I have a daily active user, automatically. I haven't done anything. All I did was add authentication. Hey, it does its job. So now I get the, the added usage of, what was that, five lines of code, full analytics, and authentication, and I get my major measures um, of the success of my app, daily active users and monthly active users. Now there are other events in here. Um, so I could add revenue events, for example, if you've got in-app purchases or if you've got advertising. Um, you might want to record events to say, hey, I just someone just clicked on an advert, and that gives you a check on the ad networks to make sure that you're getting paid properly. Given that the, um, the revenue for a typical app is something like $2,800, every single dollar counts um, in that model. So you want to make sure that the ad networks are actually paying you properly. This is a your own, your own data generating um, the clicks for you. Um, similarly, if you've got in-app purchases, you can get a live um, real-time uh, purchase history and uh, revenue calculation for your app. Um, as you build in more, um, things like the demographics, which I don't think, ooh, they are. So this is iOS, iOS 11.01.1, it's an iPhone something, it's a simulator, so it can't tell. Um, and if you include, if you're gathering geo uh, data in your app, if you've turned on the geolocation and you've actually asked for permission, the countries will show up as well. Okay, automatically. Now, why would you do that? Um, mostly for engagement, okay? The only time apps make money is when users are using them, okay? So the, the big thing for most apps is how do I get users to use my app? Well, I reach out to them, I send them push notifications, some people turn off push notifications, so I send them an email, I send them an SMS, I do things to get them back to my app, okay? And Pinpoint has a full set of facilities such that you can say, uh, reach out to people with iPhones that have not um, talked to my app in the last seven days, that have push notifications turned off, and send them an email saying, why haven't you seen my app yet? Um, you might want to be a bit more polite than that, but uh, that, that's the essence of the message. Um, and uh, that um, goes. You can do things like uh, uh, funnel rev uh, funnels and campaigns. So for those of you lucky enough to have a marketing uh, department, they love this stuff where you can say, on the first day that a person uses the app, send them this email. On the second day, send them this email. On the third day, send them a text message saying, get back here. On the fourth day, send them, start sending them push notifications and so on. And measuring the effectiveness of those funnels, of those campaigns on the actual revenue numbers. So those are all good things. Um, A-B testing, things like that are, uh, are also in there. So that's the uh, demo. How do you use it? Um, AWS Amplify works with any JavaScript framework. NPM install, AWS Amplify. There is a React bindings one, so the authenticator is the specific one because it contains UI components. You can NPM install AWS Amplify React. Um, there is a React Native version one, which I just showed. It does contain a native bridge, so you're gonna have to, if you're using Create React Native app, you need to run uh, eject, and then add the AWS Amplify React Native, and then do the link of the uh, bridge code. To configure, fairly simple. Download the AWS exports.js, 
That's what I just showed off. Um, I will actually, do you have a uh, website? Maybe. <laughs> I will post um, these slides onto SlideShare and I will uh, send a link to the, um, uh, to the group. Yeah, sure, for the meetup. Yeah. yeah. Um, analytics, and this app has all the information in for you. Um, if you can't wait for the slides, all the instructions, all the code, um, AWS Amplify is a fully open source project. It's actually one of the very first um, uh, open source, actually generated in the open source um, projects that uh, AWS has done. Um, and you can get to it at aws.github.io slash aws-amplify. And that has all the documentation, all the APIs, quick start guides, and so on. Um, authentication. If you are in React and React Native, we've have got this Authenticator module, and we've got the With Authenticator HOC, um, which provide a UI for you. At some point, you're going to want your own UI because ours, to be quite frank, is ugly. Um, so uh, you can actually use the state management system and just copy our, uh, our HOC, to be quite honest, um, and just replace the UI with your own, okay? In any other framework, you're limited to providing your own UI. Um, so we haven't done an Angular version, we haven't done a Vue version, we've only done React and React Native, which I guess applies to mo most people here. And then you add the two lines. Okay, so that is AWS Amplify in a nutshell. There are a couple of other functions. There's uh, the ability to do file uploads and downloads from S3. There's the ability to call signed RESTful APIs, so crypt cryptographically signed APIs. Those are useful because one of the common um, features that I get asked for is how do I ensure that my mobile app is the only one communicating with my mobile backend? The answer is, you can't. However, cryptographically signing your requests and throwing out requests that are not properly signed is the best way currently of doing that. It doesn't ensure it, but it makes it much, much more difficult for would-be uh, copiers to uh, actually hijack your backend. Okay? So before we get on to GraphQL and AppSync, which is a new utility service, any questions about Amplify? Uh, I have a question about the Google competitor. Uh, mm -hmm. That's obvious because yeah, yep. you have a React Native uh, Firebase, which is not a Google official, but a wrapper. Mm -hmm. um, how does Amplify compare in terms of a Firebase real-time database capability? Hold that thought for the AppSync talk. Okay. <laughs> okay, thanks. Okay, we'll go on to AppSync. Since that was the question. I have some questions. Awesome. So, you're developing a data-driven, in-the-cloud app. Um, let's just say it's a mobile CRM. Now, if you're thinking, I'm not writing a mobile CRM, all I'm doing is just doing this social app. Um, as soon as you want to share data with someone else, Okay, as soon as you want to do a news feed, you're getting into the same sorts of problems that mobile CRM. Mobile CRM, everyone grokes that, you know, orders, customers, contacts, there are three different tables, you've got, to, um, you've got to deal with all of them, you've got to do workflow, and the, there's complex relationships. Everyone grokes that, but the, the, the problem is, is that when you talk about, like, I've got the task list. I can see Marcus back there drinking a beer, and uh, I'm sharing uh, data with Marcus there. <laughs> you can hide it if you want, Marcus. It doesn't change the fact. Um, I, I'm sharing tasks with uh, Marcus in my app, and we've both got the mobile app. Okay. Um, and I go, I want to share this app, this task with Marcus so that Marcus can update it. As soon as I do that, we've got two lists of tasks. We're sharing data between the two. We've got this problem. Um, <laughs> The problem is a couple of things. Number one, how does the data get updated? If I update my copy of the task and he updates his copy of the task, how does he know that mine has changed? 
For that, you need some sort of near real-time feed. Um, what happens if the network goes away? You need some sort of offline access. If he and I both edit at the same time, what happens? You need some sort of conflict resolution. And if we have those complex relationships, how do they actually work? So, I have a mobile app, and I have a data source, that's wonderful. Um, how can I implement all this and still have great user experience? Well, the first thought is, well, hey, REST. REST has been out there for a long time, right? Um, it's trivial to set up, standard HTTP calls, we can win with REST. The problem is, is the explosion of REST endpoints when you get starting to get, get into relationships. REST doesn't have any concept of lists, queries, ordering, paging. You've got to build all that in yourself. So, um, and it has no real-time notifications. You've got to build that in yourself. So you end up building an awful lot of things and it gets more and more and more complicated. You also have to version because at the end of the day, your mobile app has got a, a set of views and your REST endpoints are providing the data for those views. That means that your security boundary, which is your database, and your views are actually in the same place. You're putting, your, you're putting the requirements of your mobile app on the back end. Not a bad place to be, but uh, it tightly couples your back end with your front end and you have to end up versioning and getting into all sorts of, um, uh, all, all sorts of uh, complex um, uh, data resourcing. So, uh, is there another option? Well, the next option I would suggest is OData. We would certainly went down that place. I used to run Azure Mobile, another competitor, um, and we used OData as our data source, which was great, standard libraries. It supported filtering, ordering, paging, uh, out of the box, but it was really difficult to set up. I mean, really difficult. Um, it was not unusual to have um, a, a whole entity framework uh, data set just for um, uh, just for handling uh, the O data endpoint. Um, there are no standard mutations. There is no way of submitting a task with an associated task with an associated file with um, that's shared with Marcus. Um, you'd have to write those yourself. So really spotty relationship support that you had to program in yourself. It was very SQL specific, which is great if you're using SQL, and not so great if you were using anything else at all. Uh, and you still had a problem with notifications. So how did, if Marcus changes his task, how do I get notified about it? So let's just step back and think about some requirements. Um, I want to separate the data view and the security view. I want the back end to define what the app, front app can do, and I want the front end to define what it will do. Um, I want complex query support. I want search, pagination, batching. I want real-time notifications. I want offline. I want this to work in an actual mobile app, so that means I have to care about bandwidth and battery. And I want something standard. I don't want to be uh, dealing with uh, custom clients just because that's what's required. So that's where GraphQL came in. GraphQL is a standardized way of querying a data source and a standardized way of mutating a data source. Um, and you basically post to an endpoint. Um, it's by, by convention, it's whatever server name slash GraphQL. And you, app, you, you send it a query, and you send it what fields you want back. <coughs> so you might have a customer list, and I want the name. Um, if you think about this typical, something like 70% of all the non-game apps on the app stores, and the app stores have something like 5 million apps on it, so that's a big number, are master detail, list and details. Yeah? Um, so, and the list has a lot of a lot of records come back, and it only has a restricted amount of data. It might have a title, it might have the person's contact name, whatever it is. 
Um, and then you click over to the details and it's got a whole slew of uh, information. So um, think about it that way. Um, when you're talking about the list, you might want to talk, where's my other ones? Ah, there they are, further down. You might want to talk with, um, uh, for example, a list of movies. You might want to have the list of movies and just return the data. You might want to do the first two movies. Or more likely, you'd go like, okay, here's my big long list, but I only want to do the first 10 movies because I know that this list has, uh, has got 10,000 items in it and the user is not going to scroll that much. Or maybe they're gonna flick up and go to record number 8,000 straight away. I don't know. So I want a system flexible enough to do that. Well, we can do that. Once I found my movie, I want to press on it, and it will open up the detail page, and now I want all of the records. I want all of the uh, fields in that record, so I want more of the um, data for a specific item. Maybe I want the specific movie and the actors who are in it. Fairly common query. Uh, so I can do those sorts of relationships with, it's, it's actually built into the GraphQL uh, specification. So where was I back up here? So GraphQL gives you um, a rapid prototyping, and it's rapid prototyping because of that post capability. Okay, I can use standard HTTP calls um, and do a simple query and make sure that it gets the same uh, data and then I can put that query and cut and paste it into my application and I'm done. Um, I can do introspection. A lot of the um, GraphQL browsers uh, like Graphical, um, which is GraphIQL, which is an inter interactive GraphQL browser, or the GraphQL IDE or the GraphQL Playground are uh, use introspection, which they, means that they will tell you once you give them the endpoint um, what queries are, are available, what mutations are available, and what fields are available. So you can just drag and drop, and it will tell you if it's wrong. Um, the interesting thing is is where the security boundary is and where the data uh, viewer is. The security boundary is where it belongs. It's on the back end. The data view is where it belongs, it's on the front end. So what this means is the back end will iterate much, much slower because you're not having to do changes as a result of every single request that the front end developer has. So you can make that change, that deployment very, very slow. And the, the front end can iterate as fast as they want. They can release 10 versions of the app because the uh, back end is not changing that much. And we have a data behavior control, it's at the right place on the server, and we have bandwidth optimization because the, the, the uh, client is only asking for the fields that it needs. Um, great website to learn GraphQL is graphql.org slash learn. Um, there's a lot more to the uh, language, and the service that I'm gonna talk about has it all. So, um, I just did all these. So, so what is AWS AppSync? GraphQL with benefits, I think, is the best way to describe it. It is a fully managed AWS utility data service. It links to your data source. Now, if you want to talk about what's the difference between this and Firebase database, for example, um, try getting data out of Firebase. That's all I can say, um, if you want to do a backup. So because you own the data, you own the database. It's your database, it's your data, pull it out, do it whatever you want with it. Um, you own and control your data. If you want to connect it to a different um, data source, do it. We don't care. Um, you get sub subscriptions with real-time notifications. Um, we've actually made this in a scalable uh, manner so it should be able to scale to um, everyone's favorite 10 million users. Um, it is fully enabled with offline out of the box. You don't have to do anything special, you just turn it on. Um, now we have conflict resolution in the cloud. That means that you can specify a policy for how to do conflict resolution. So 
if there's a conflict, if you don't have the latest version of the data, it will tell you you don't have the latest version of the data and kick you out. You could also do last right wins. So you could do your right wins, always. Um, you could silently fail. You can do something custom. So the one I was making a reference to earlier is, let's just say, Marcus and I are working on the same record in that CRM, and Marcus is more important than me. I can actually code that relationship in a lambda, uh, a function, when a conflict happens, Marcus's record, because he's more important than me, Marcus's record overwrites my changes. Okay, so you can do custom logic like that very easily. You always get the ability to fall back to um, a online custom uh, conflict handler in the client. So it will say, hey, there's a conflict, here's the old version, here's the new version, what do you want to do? And then you say, this is the right version, and you override the, uh, the server, okay? Um, enterprise level security features. I kind of think that this is important for a lot of reasons. Um, we are in Germany, there's GDPR coming up. Um, there's a level of interest in on-disk encryption. The entire system can be made secure end-to-end. -end. And the fact that we sign every single request, we communicate over um, high-grade security, HTTPS, and you can encrypt the data on the uh, uh, on disk, gives you a very, very high level of uh, security. So how do you use AppSync? Um, currently, it is in public preview. Now, public preview in AWS terms means it's being run as a GA service, but we are limiting access to it. So you actually have to sign up and get whitelisted. Um, that's primarily uh, because we don't know the full extent of the scalability yet. So we're trying to onboard people um, a bit slower than we would normally do if we were just uh, if we were just sure of the scalability numbers and could just turn it on. Um, so it's just a protection for a early service. Um, we integrate with the Apollo GraphQL client. That's fairly much the standard de facto client. Um, we've also written an iOS client, and there is an Android client in the works. Um, we're looking at extending support for other things, but uh, Apollo GraphQL works with React Native. That means it will also work with um, technologies like Relay, for example. Um, offline support is automatic. If you, uh, if you put any of the cache policies in there, it will automatically happen for anything that you download, so you won't have to re-download it. Um, it's right through for mutations. Um, and uh, real-time support. It's, uh, we open a WebSocket uh, connection to the back end to receive real-time notifications. We call it near real-time because we happen to know what real-time is and what we are doing is definitely not real-time. But then again, what everyone else is doing is definitely not real-time as well, so we're at least as good as everyone else. Um, it's an event-driven model from the perspective of the GraphQL interface. So if you are mutating the database underneath the covers, those changes do not get propagated to the uh, clients. Automatic uh, cloud-based resolution, I've talked about that. Um, now, the, the interesting thing is it can be used in any data source. We support out-of-the-box DynamoDB, which is AWS's um, uh, NoSQL data store. We can also do Elasticsearch, and that provides for GraphQL access to geolocated data, for example. Also, full-text faceted searches, if you want it. And we can also do any Lambda. Um, so that allows you to integrate any data source that we don't support. And it's actually relatively simple to do so. You just need a bit of JavaScript knowledge, and I'm pretty sure everyone in this room can write JavaScript. At least I hope so. <laughs> so the next question people are going to ask is, well, how much is it going to cost me? I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Okay. So here is how much it costs in US dollars. The euros have their own conversion. Check our pricing page for the latest pricing. 
whilst it is in preview, it is free. Okay? So, um, this doesn't mean much because I have no idea how many queries and updates and things like that are actually going to uh, occur. So let's look at an example. Um, we produced a chat application. It was used during reInvent by our team. Um, about 2,500 users at the time. Um, and we looked at it over the month of uh, November. This is what we came into. Now you can see that the queries and the real-time connections drive the, or rather the queries and the real-time updates drive the bulk of the cost. Um, we did relatively large number of scenarios to prove out that the pricing was good and that was always the case. Your queries and your real-time connections, real-time updates, drive the cost of the, uh, uh, of the service. The minutes and the data transfer really are a rounding error. Um, DynamoDB has a really, really generous free tier. So if you're using DynamoDB, it's likely to be free, but take into account any uh, database um, charges that you do have. So this chat application, $15 a month for 2,500 users. Um, if you're not making that in advertising, you need to go somewhere else for your advertising. So, some best practices for uh, getting started with uh, GraphQL. Don't boil the ocean. Um, our very first customer was a beta customer. Um, he went with um, a rather large application and started off with, well, I'll do a multi-table, complex relationship, all with fully offline support, everything uh, real-time subscribed to, um, and everyone just killed him because uh, it killed their battery, killed the bandwidth on their uh, service. Um, so just start with maybe offline query support and then see how that goes and then build up to the real-time subscriptions. Use subscriptions appropriately. Um, subscriptions have a cost. It doesn't matter who's doing them, they have a cost in terms of battery and bandwidth. You're doing a lot of traffic to do um, a very small thing. So use those subscriptions only for rapidly evolving mutations. If it's a slower type thing, considering using a silent push notification instead that would uh, uh, that, that you could capture and um, automate a uh, forced sync. And don't overcomplicate the conflict resolution. Um, I've been doing offline for the better part of five years now. Um, 90% of the time, offline conflicts do not happen. That 10%, they can usually be easily resolved. So at worst, get out the easy ones. And then there's a 0.1% set where you go, I really need to throw up a UI for this. Um, so don't concentrate on the 0.1%, concentrate on the 99.9%. .9%. And then finally, and I'll take questions after this, a whole bunch of um, GraphQL services. Um, the GraphQL client is on uh, GitHub, it's an open source project. Um, the AWS App Sync console, once you get to it, um, it has the ability to generate GraphQL queries for you. There's also Graphical, the GraphQL IDE, there's a one that I use is called the GraphQL Playground. It's a desktop app. Uh, Chrome has a plugin for syntax highlighting. If you use DevTools and you see the network connections going across, it has a uh, syntax highlighter for GraphQL queries and responses. So that's kind of handy. Um, so other than that, questions? Yes? The subscriptions <coughs> are uh the one from Apollo GraphQL, or did you have something new about the subscriptions? So Apollo GraphQL um, puts in, the, the way that Apollo GraphQL works is that there's two parts. There's the GraphQL, and there's the AppSync client, or whatever GraphQL server client that you're uh, using. Um, and the, the, the subscription piece is handed to the GraphQL, uh, the underlying uh, service, um, provider to actually implement. So the subscriptions are done by uh, AWS, it's unique code to us. 
they won't work with anything else. Um, there are, uh, you know, GraphQL has their version, and uh, I hear Realm has just launched a, a GraphQL service as well, so. So, um, did you resolve somehow the problem that if I uh, fetch now the data, mm -hmm. and then I subscribe, or I subscribe first, I don't know, the next record that I receive is the fourth and not the fifth, so. Yes, we did solve that. Okay, thank you. We actually reported that one back to Apollo, and it's, uh, it's actually, we've been submitting um, fixes back to the Apollo GraphQL uh, service as well. So uh, the, the GraphQL client is uh, getting improved because of AppSync. Mm -hmm. Yes, over here. Is there a way to throttle the number of events that the server sends to the mobile client? Like Let's say it's like Facebook and you get likes on George Clooney video. Um, the, there is, and it's in the GraphQL client as, uh, again. So you don't get ev you don't get every single um, on the subscription. They'll send them. They'll send uh, batches of them uh, where necessary, uh, because what happens is you get a, a query and then you'll get the bulk one next. So you you won't get individual the records at that point. But it's in the way that the uh, subscriptions work. More questions? So thanks, Adrian, for the talk. <laughs> and we'll have a short QA afterwards. Um, we will have five minutes break, so we have to leave here at the latest at 10, <laughs> according to Marcus. And um, so five minute break just for you to relax a bit, and then we'll be back for the QA. Yeah.